joining us, and we're so delighted that you took some time today to talk about one of our favorite subjects, uh, Duratec High Gloss Additive. We're going to talk a little bit about how this gel coat or how this gel coat additive does exactly what we are showing you on the screen, which is to make your make your gel coat spray a little bit more like paint. Before we get in too much onto the high gloss additive itself, let me tell you a little bit about us and about Hawkeye Industries so you know who you're hanging out with this afternoon. My name is Shelly Benyon. I am the general manager here at Hawkeye Industries. Hawkeye was founded in 1983. So we're coming up on our 40th um, birthday next year. So we'll likely have a little bit of a celebration for that. We are the marketing sales and service provider for the Duratec product line, the Aquabuff product line, which is a line of compounds and polishes, and Styrosafe, which is our resin and also primer option for working with EPS foam. So if you're unfamiliar with Aquabuff or the Duratec product line in general, or Styrosafe, while we won't talk about those today, we have lots of resources online and we'll talk about those at the end so you can find out more about all of our all of our fantastic products. Um, joining me today on this webinar is my intrepid co-host Jody Wise. Say hello, Jody. Well, hello everybody. Nice to see everybody here today. Thank you for coming. <laughs> so Jody is our West Regional Sales Manager. So if you happen to have your facility, either a distribution center or a production facility or a boatyard and you are west of the Rockies, either north up into Canada or south down in Mexico and here in the US, Jody is the sales manager that would be the resource for you. I'm located here in Chicago, Illinois. I'm in the central territory. I cover both the central United States, the Eastern United States, up into Canada, and then I support our international customers as well. And while he's actually on the floor at a customer's today, so he's not joining us live, Rob Smothers is incredibly passionate about high gloss additive. Rob is based out of Florida. He covers the Southern and South Central United States. So if you happen to be based out of those states, Rob is your point of contact. And like I said, he loves high gloss additive and is a great resource for that. So he is not on our, our webinar today, but we'll have his contact information available for you at the end of our session. So like I said, we're located all across the US. Jody, Rob, and I are all across the US, as is our amazing customer service team. And while you won't meet them today, there are some of them hiding here behind their cameras. And they're joining us today both to continue their Hawkeye education and to make sure that they are absolute ready support for you when you call in with questions or when you call in looking for one of us. So they're here along with Allison Spees who is doing our uh, slideshow for us. Allison is our marketing associate. And so if you haven't met Allison or seen her, you're seeing her throughout our presentation today. And you certainly see her voice if you follow us on social media. She keeps us, she keeps us hopping and making us look cool and fun on social media. So that's who we are. That's a little bit about what we do. Today, though, we're focused solely on one product and it is one of our most popular products. It is the Duratec High Gloss Additive. This product has been around since the inception of Hawkeye Industries. It is one of the founding Duratec products. It is well loved, it is versatile. Um, and that's what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about how this little powerful additive takes your standard gel coat and helps it to lay down more smoothly, how it improves your tooling gel coat, how it can make a repair really shine and match your original paint job, and how to how to use those use that product in the ways that are the most impactful for you. So at the very beginning I mentioned that we'll be answering throughout this presentation some of what we're covering are the answers to our frequently asked questions. But at the very end of the presentation, we'll also have a Q&A session where we would very much welcome questions that you have, either as they come up in the conversation today, or maybe you've been thinking about them for a while, or you've tried high gloss additive and you're curious about doing something different. So um, we'll, we'll try to pepper those in throughout and we'll try to make sure we leave plenty of time at the end so we can cover all of the questions that you have. 
Our focus today is to cover the key uses for high gloss for the Duratec high gloss additive. So the different ways in which you can use it. Maybe you're currently using it, and something we mentioned um, might improve your process in another way. We will help you determine what the best blend ratios are. So how to mix and match a little bit depending on what you're trying to achieve. We'll talk about catalysts and make sure you're on the right path with that. And then we'll cover, like I said, some of our more frequently asked questions and then point you in the right direction for resources. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jody. He's gonna start us off with the key uses for DuraTech High Gloss Additive. Jody. Yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of uses for this product and customers bring us new uses for it all the time, but uh, the, probably the most used applications are adding it to gel coat so that it will cure tack-free without any other uh, wax or PVA being used. Uh, it's the air cured chemistry in the product. Uh, it, it improves the tooling surfaces. You can add it to tooling gel coat. Uh, there's benefits to that. It also provides a better thorough cure, especially in a thin film because our products are not air inhibited. So even in a thin film, they will cure very well and it will help gel coat cure better in a thin film and it elevates the shine. You typically get a higher gloss uh, adding our clear additive to a typical gel coat, mainly because you're reducing the amount of fillers and pigments as a percentage in the mix. And those fillers and pigments don't necessarily yield a high gloss, but they do yield color. So you can uh, get a better gloss out of it by adding our product. All right, so, oh, Allison, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna have Jody pause for just, if you'll go back for just a second. So Jody, when someone's making the decision to add it to a tooling gel coat in specific, what would be the reason that they would consider that? Uh, tooling gel coats are typically difficult to use because they try and reduce the, the number of ingredients in tooling gel coats. Because again, like I said before, when you're adding pigments, uh, silica, other fillers, those don't retain a high gloss and we're trying to use them for a, in a tooling gel coat, it reduces the gloss and you end up having to detail the mold far more often and it doesn't release as well. So they rely on the pigments themselves as in a black gel coat, the, uh, carbon black pigment to puff up the gel coat. And what you end up with is a rather puffy, hard to use product. I understand why they do it that way, but I've worked with chemists in the lab and I say, but why do you have to make it so puffy and hard to use and you get porosity? And they said, well, that's just the way we do it. So that was as far as those conversations <laughs> ever got. And the solution in the field is to add something like a uh, solvent to it to reduce the viscosity so it sprays better, sprays smoother, uh, a few other things. The problem is that messes with the chemistry. Mm. And when you add our product to it, uh, it, it improves the air release. It allows it to spray and level and flow easier. So you get a, a much better finish on there. Now you, you need to frequently, uh, adjust the amount you're adding. We make recommendations on the amount to add, but you may need to adjust that for your specific uh, case. You don't always add the exact uh, same amount every time. Gotcha. This will give you a, a better cure and a better shine. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Allison, for pausing there for me. All right. So, Jody, this is, this is one of the... Uh, like, I don't know that it's a best kept secret necessarily because there are lots of folks that are doing this, some of whom I know are on this call with us today. But I don't think that, you know, this is not our most commonly used application, but you can take Duratec High Gloss Additive and add it into one of the other Duratec primers for a little extra boost. Would you talk for a minute about that? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that frequently people ask, well, I want to get just a little bit better gloss out of my primer. We don't want to add uh, another application of a coating over it, whether it's a gel coat or one of our top coats for tooling, the tooling process. 
we want to just use the primer. Now we do have one primer that that will yield a higher gloss, but sometimes people want to customize that gloss for their own purposes or the leveling and flowing so they they uh, can sand it and polish it easier. And you can add the clear additive to any of our uh, primers and it will lower the viscosity, it will spray, level and flow better, but the trade-off is it won't sand quite as easily. So those, those mm -hmm. fillers in there aid the sanding of the product. And as you reduce them, it's going to be a little bit harder of a surface. Now that yields the higher gloss. So there's the benefits there. Also, sure. if somebody needs to take more parts and say, you, if it's a one-off, it doesn't make much difference. But if you wanna get five pulls off of this plug or this one-off part that you've just designed, you may wanna add some of the clear additive to that primer to strengthen it, uh, make it a little easier to demold and retain the gloss better. And that's a perfect lead in Jody. That's the, the plug that we're seeing in the picture of a nose cone from Washington University. The reason that they added 904001 to the light gray primer was exactly that. They wanted to be able to pull a couple of different molds off of the surface, not just the one. So like you said, there's always a trade-off, but knowing that it's an option and being able to make that differentiation when it's important to you, the customer, that's, an, that's key for us, is that you understand the variability or the versatility so you can make it work in the way that you need it to. Awesome. And our most popular use, I think, I think in my opinion, of the high gloss additive is straight with gel coat, marine applications, uh, exterior part applications. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yes. Uh, frequently when, when people want to respray something or they need to spray gel coat, uh, one of the complaints they have is that it is so thick and high viscosity that it's hard to spray, it's hard to use, you have to do a lot of sanding to get the, the finish that you want. Uh, the gloss isn't as high as they would want it to be, that sort of thing. Uh, when you add the clear additive to gel coat, you're not adding a solvent to it. You're adding a high quality base resin to it that does not interfere with the quality of the gel coat base. Whereas the solvents and several other additives can do that uh, yeah, it makes it a little easier to use up front, but it makes it, the quality of your part isn't as high, good as it could be. You could be making a better, longer lasting part with a higher gloss that's more UV resistant, water resistant, crack resistant, that sort of thing. So those are the benefits. Uh, it, it can cut days of sanding. If you have to respray a hull or a deck, it can cut days and days out of sanding that to get a nice suit, smooth surface. And in fact, some people don't even sand it. They will just spray their hull. They'll add the clear additive to the gel coat at the right ratio, spray the hull and leave it. Now in a perfect world, you're going to get some bugs in there. You're going to get some other things. It's not going to be perfect, but from five feet away, it will look fantastic. And that's, that's what you're concerned about. Uh, you just skipped all the sanding and polishing, but if you want an even better finish, you can go in with a much finer grit sandpaper and with much less labor involved and, and the cost of sandpaper, it, 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 the cost is high. So if you can you reduce the amount of sandpaper used, uh, it's a big advantage. And now you can get a very smooth high gloss finish that can be repaired in the future. Yep, fantastic. Um, one of our most frequently asked questions, and it's referenced here on this slide, Jody, is the the necessity to use wax or PVA. And I'm going to stick. I know we have some variations on that theme, but specifically when we're talking about um, a, uh, this application, gel coats with 90401 in a kind of our standard use, does does it require PVA or wax? It does not require PVA or wax used in this fashion. There are times when you may want to add wax to it, but I, I think that we can answer that in, the, in uh, more detail a little bit later, I think. Yeah, excellent. All right, just before we move off of the slide, I just want to mention the boat that is featured in this. This is actually a recent job. Thank you, Allison, for highlighting that. Uh, this is one of Rob's mother's customers who did their entire boat interior and exterior with 
um, their gel coat of choice and Doratec high gloss additive. So it's kind of fun to see a little bit of that baby blue from, from our seats here. We're, we're kind of in a gray and red and darker gray world. So anytime we get a little color is fun. Thanks, Allison. This is, speaking of gray and red and white, this is a, another example of a whole finish with the gel coat of choice, a couple of different gel coat options and high gloss additive. You'll notice, and this is, this is why we have this slide here, you'll notice that we've got red and we've got white. And one of the questions that we get asked frequently is in regards to color choice, you know, gel coat color choice and mixed ratios. So we're gonna shift a little bit and talk about mixed ratios. Jody touched on this a few minutes ago when, when he mentioned that we have suggestions, we have best practices, and then we know that what your experience looks like or what your desired outcome looks like might be slightly different. So we're gonna go through four standard mix ratio options and talk a little bit about the reasons why the difference and the variations. And then just know that if you've heard something different, ask about it in our question and answers. If you wanna try something different, customers test and trial things all of the time and tell us what magic they make with it. Um, we, we welcome the feedback from you. There's no right answer here. These are options for variation um, that come from the years that Duratec High Gloss Additive has been in use. So the first one that you're seeing on your screen here is the mix ratio for regular use. Maybe you're um, like in that picture before you're doing um, a full entire whole boat hole and you're, you're doing the entire work job. Um, in this case, you might wanna mix, especially if you're using a white gel coat, you might wanna mix 50-50. 50% high gloss additive with 50% of your gel coat, gel coat of choice. That 50-50 is going to improve the, as Jody talked about before, it's gonna lower that viscosity. It's really going to improve the level and flow of the gel coat out of your gun and onto your surface. We're gonna talk a little bit about orange peel here in a few minutes, but it's going to improve, um, it's going to improve or resist the orange peel from occurring. And, and help you to, to achieve the surface profile that you're looking for. So that's a 50% blend, 50-50, or one to, people will, will refer to it as one-to-one -one as well. If you're looking at our literature, you see it as 50-50. That one is not always recommended when there are concerns about opacity or hide. And that's where we come to this mixed ratio of 75% of your gel coat of choice and 25% of the Duratec high gloss additive. That mix ratio will allow the pigments Jody mentioned before to really stay heavily sat to stay to stay heavily present. Um, it will still allow that the, the gel coat to air cure. It will still allow um, for a high gloss. It will still improve the level and flow out of the gun. Not quite not quite the same to the amount of the or not to the same degree as the 50-50 blend would. But if height is particularly a concern or if your color is diluted, if you go 50-50, 75-25 is just fine. So those are the two um, with kind of the standard gel coat applications. If you're working with tooling gel coat, um, tooling gel coat, you know, it's the tooling gel coat is designed to be a different beast. It's not the same as a standard marine gel coat. It's, it's form and function is slightly different. So how much you add on this slide, we've recommended 10 to 25%. Um, how much you add might be very dependent on what it is that you're trying to achieve. What's your goal? Are you looking for um, a, a, a way to avoid any kind of wax or PVA? Are you looking for a way to improve durability? Are you looking for a better gloss level? Are you looking for improved surface out of the gun? That's 10 to 25% might flex a little bit based off of what you need from, from the performance. Now, Jody, we were talking about this when we met before. Is there anything on this specific one that, that I might have missed that you would want to add to this blend ratio? I, what this really does for you is it allows you to 
retain all of the good physical properties of the tooling gel coat and maybe improve a little bit on them and uh, allow it to spray out of the gun much easier. When I was talking earlier about it being thick and pasty, that's the nature of the beast for most tooling gel coats. And, and it can, depending on the pigment loading and the exact color, it can be a little bit different. Uh, but if you're trying to spray it out of a, a, especially a gravity feed gun or even a pressure pot, it can be difficult to do and it's kind of frustrating and you end up adding some solvent to it. Almost everybody you talk to adds some solvent to it. If the solvent helped, it would already be in there. So most of them are an inhibitor. They can interfere with cure. They can interfere with the hardness of the finished product. So you don't really want those things in there. Uh, the clear additive gives you the option to not use those use the clear additive, get the viscosity down, get a little better cure, and a benefit of possibly a little bit better gloss too. So there's a few things that it can do for you and relieve some of the frustration. Now, on the 15% uh, percent add, if you're doing it in mold, uh, maybe you want 10%, maybe you want 15%. It's, it's totally dependent on the gel coat you're buying and what you're doing you may want to adjust that ratio a little bit. If you're post applying this or refinishing a tool or spraying it onto a plug and you want to polish and sand it, you may want to add a little bit more of the clear additive to it so that it levels and flows better and sprays more like paint. Uh, you're, you're not compromising the physical properties of the gel coat. Now, if you want to build it up thick, yes, it's, it's going to have a lower viscosity, so you have to be careful you're not going to get any sags, and you have to build it up a little bit slower, but there's still uh, the option to do that without adding solvent. And if you add the clear additive, you can typically get it out of your gun quicker, so now you're back up to the correct catalyst ratios for the gel coat itself, and you're not stressing over the fact that it's... Uh, 90 degrees in the shop and you just mixed up a quart of material and you're hoping you can get it out of the gun. This, this, this helps. It's, it's not a total cure, but it helps. Fantastic. Uh, we, we've heard, we've heard many of those, those tall tales before. As you're talking, I'm smiling, thinking of conversations with, with customers over time. So the last, the last thing that we'll highlight, the last mix ratio that we'll highlight, and again, these are recommendations. These are based off of outcome. So as Jody mentioned, the 10% addition in mold with tooling gel coat might be the better fit for you. This is the mix ratio recommendation for use with Duratec primers. Again, the, the Duratec primer job is generally to prepare a surface for some sort of top coating. Um, but there are times that you're, especially if you're doing plug and pattern work, that perhaps your plug does not require an additional top coat. Your finished part or your mold surface does not require the ultimate gloss, a class A finish, um, com complete, smooth, um, defect-free surface. It might, it might actually require a little bit more texture, a little bit more um, uniqueness, surface, surface uniqueness. So in this case, adding 25%, which was, if you remember going back, we had the 75, 25% blend for standard gel coat practices. The same is, is similar with the, the Duratec primers. 25% high gloss additive will improve your flow out of the gun. It will um, help resist orange peel across the surface. It will uh, strengthen the durability of that primer. So if you are doing this with a plug, it might, it will, allow that plug to be used in multiple pools rather than maybe just as the one-off you had originally intended. Um, and it will bring the gloss of the Duratec primers to a, a medium gloss without a lot of sanding or buffing work involved. So sometimes that's a real win for folks who um, want to be able to take, take their, their plug surface and, and create a mold off of that without a, a significant amount of, of time and expense added into it. So that's the last mix ratio that we're going to recommend today or that we're going to talk about. Once you've determined your mix ratio, this is, this is the conversation that we have often and that we really appreciate having often because it allows us to emphasize and to clarify catalyzing 
after a text. So once you've determined your blend ratio, so maybe you're doing 50-50, maybe you're, you're kicking up the glass level of Duratex surface primer, whatever your mix blend is, you catalyze to the full blend amount. Now, let me pause for a second and clarify. You don't catalyze that entire blend amount, but when you go to use the material, you want to pour off. So let's just say you've blended it up. You've got your one completed gallon sitting off to the side. You don't want to catalyze that entire gallon of, of gel coat Duratec high gloss additive. The clock starts ticking. I'm sure all of you are nodding along because you know this. This is basic information, but it's helpful for us to repeat it. You don't want to catalyze the entirety of that amount. Rather, pour off what you are going to be able to spray in, what would you say, Jody? about 20 minutes, 18 minutes? It, depending on the temperature, between 10 to 15, 18 minutes, right in there. Okay. Um, so depending on the temperature, depending on the gel coat a little bit as well, too? Right. Okay. We, we can't say exactly what it's going to be because because uh, all the products out there, they don't all have all have the same gel time. So yeah. some of them are 10 minutes, some of them are 20 minutes plus. So it's it's just kind of a do a test first. You don't want to under catalyze. If there's any question, mix up and catalyze less product at one time and spray it out of the gun rather than trying to under catalyze and use a larger amount. Under catalyzing it, we say 2%. The, the ideal catalyzation is someplace around 1.75%. 2% is right in the ballpark. If we recommended 1.5%, people would be at 1% at catalyzation. So it really, if you can be at 2%, that's great. Uh, so often we hear of people at 1% or lower yeah, it eventually gets hard, but eventually getting hard does not mean that it's thoroughly cured. It just means that it seemed harder than it was when it was liquid state in the container. Uh, it won't retain the gloss. It won't be as water resistant. It won't be as crack resistant. The surface will be, the surface will be softer and easier to scratch. Uh, it will yellow sooner. There, there'll be a lot of problems. If people have seen uh, old Bayliner boats out there and I'm picking on, not Bayliner, uh, uh, Boston Whaler, and I'm picking on Boston Whaler, but it's only because people rebuild a lot of Boston Whalers. They're very popular boats. They go for a lot of money. They're out there, but you see all the crazing on the gel coat on some of the older ones. Unfortunately, although there's a lot of misinformation as to what that's caused by. It's usually caused by poorly catalyzed and poorly applied gel coat. Uh, just being thick does not do that. Uh, just being in the sun does not cause the crazing. It's typically the under or over catalyzation uh, of, of gel coats and polyester products that causes that kind of a defect. So that, that's just a warning. If somebody's refinishing their boat and they want to not use enough catalyst, that's what can happen. Excellent. So I, I brought my little show and tell in here. This is my favorite little travel companion. Well, one of my favorite travel companions. It's my digital kitchen scale that I, I use and it travels with me to help make sure that I am measuring out the catalyst correctly. You'll see on all of our documents when we reference um, working with initiator that we're talking about um, adding 2% by weight. It's very common across the industry, across, you know, marine shops all across the world, wherever you happen to be at to also um, catalyze by volume. The key for us is that you are consistent in which method you use catalyzing by weight or catalyzing by volume. And I recognize that the word catalyst and the word initiator kind of get used interchangeably. Um, hopefully, hopefully I'm using terminology that all that makes sense to everyone, but we're talking about MEKP catalyst being used as the initiator in the gel coat high gloss additive blends. Whichever you do, volume or weight, we want you to be consistent. And as Jody mentioned, we want you to be as accurate as possible to that 2% so that 
we're ensuring that, or rather you're ensuring that all the necessary cross-linking that needs to take place does so over time within the material. So we'll probably have a couple of, of questions about catalysts that we'll circle back to if they come up in our Q&A, um, but our technical data sheets as well walk through that so you've got that information. All right, Allison, I'm sorry I made you pop back to <laughs> pop back a screen. So this, this, or not this, these topics come up regularly, not just in the marine world, but as people are using gel coat to finish parts and to um, make, make creative things. We hear about it in the swimming pool world. We hear about it in um, the, the, the marine toy world, so boat adjacent creations. So Jody's going to talk a little bit about some of our tips and tricks when you're dealing with a high gloss additive gel coat blend, flake, shark grit, or sand, and those kind of additives into the mix. Jody? And again, this is one of those where we can give some suggestions, but, but our suggestions are just that. Uh, one of the things when you're mixing our product into a gel coat, there's no right or wrong amount to mix in. It will cure and get hard no matter how little or how much you put in. When I say get hard, the whole thing will cure. Now, at lower ratios, the surface cure may not be the same, but at, at, it will still all cure. Now, when you're using it to create a look like a metallic finish or metal flake finish or sand, sometimes it looks like granite, just depends on what you want to add to that. Frequently, there are uh, different mix ratios. Now, we also make some other products. Sunshield is one of them. If you want something that's totally clear that can be used along with this, that's what you may use as the first layer, the layer that you're touching. Behind that, there's several different looks that you can have. And, and the reason you want to clear on the surface is because any of these other materials that you add, if you don't have a clear on the surface to work with, to do any repairs with, to sand and polish or whatever it may need to be done, you won't be able to do it if you're just sanding right into the flake or grit or, or uh, stone mix in there. What, uh, what you wanna do is, is do several practice runs and make sure you're getting the look that you want before you jump in and try something much larger. Uh, so you're gonna maybe blend in, you want sort of a translucent look so somebody can see this metallic that you're putting in there. You may still want a lot of color in there and the bass boat industry does this all the time. They're not always mixing flake into something that is uh, a solid color or a complete clear. Sometimes the gel coat is tinted. They use a little bit of colored gel coat in there and it adds some depth. You can see into it, but you can still see your metal flake in there. And the amount of metal flake that you add can make a big difference. It can be a <laughs> solid look metal flake or it can be evenly dispersed with lots of gaps in it and have a tint. And a lot of the pool companies that do their refinishing, they capitalize on this because they can give the customer whatever look they want. And if you experiment with it, you can get that look. Uh, yeah. What you need to do is test it though. Uh, <laughs> take a piece of glass and an old window from when you had the windows pulled out or go down to, the, to someplace, get an old mirror, anything, wax it up, yeah. do some tests on it. You put the clear down first, you put the, and this is for in mold finishes to start with because it's a reverse operation when you're post applying it. But you're gonna wanna put a little bit of the uh, clear down first and then your blends and do several different blends because it doesn't always cure and look the same or look like you think it's going to look when you yeah. use certain ratios. So change it up a little bit. The background color can make the whole look different, the whole look of the product different. And so can any tint you put into one of the layers with the flake or grit or sand or anything else added to it. So you're gonna get a different look. Uh, so experiment around, you can be extremely creative with this. Uh, it, can, it can really uh, benefit you because you can get a unique look. But remember what you did and write it down because especially if you have to repair or do anything later, mix up the entire yeah. batch at one time so it's all the same. So if you have to come back and 
do some touch-ups later or a second application somewhere, it all looks the same. You wanna be as accurate as you can with each blend. But again, no right, nothing right or wrong. You're just looking for, some, for the, what suits your needs for, for this particular job or project. So Jody, one of the questions I know we get with mixing sharp grit or sand into, uh, when we're talking about any, any application where we're adding sharp grit or adding sand, specifically away from flakes for just a minute, one of the questions we frequently get is, you know, can I roll this? Can I roll this? You know, I've, I've put my original gel coat high gloss additive down. I've put in my sprinkle of sand or my layer of sharp grit, whatever it is that I'm using. And now I'm ready to put something on top of that. Can I roll it rather than spray it? Yeah, you can, you can roll it. That's not a problem for, for any kind of a non-skid surface where it's gonna have a te textured finish. You can roll it on there and frequently to adjust how aggressive that surface is, uh, you may put one, two or three coats on there because if you're using sand or some, of, some other product that is extremely aggressive and if you skin your knee, uh, it's, it's gonna be deep because they, it's, it's like sandpaper. It will take off some hide. Uh, some of the other things you can buy at the hardware store are much finer grit and they're not quite as aggressive. But if you've got regular sand that you're using, just put more coats over the top of it, roll them on and adjust it for as aggressive as you wanna get or the look you wanna get. Sometimes the non-skid is part of the unique look of the part and they want a certain texture. Uh, sometimes it's, it's sand or other things, you know, real aggressive, nice, finely textured, a different color, uh, mm -hmm. all of those things. And remember, whatever, the color of the grit is, the high points on that grit are going to wear down over time and you're going to see what that grit is. So if it's a dark colored sand, you're going to see, and it's a white surface, a gel coat you're using, you're going to see the tips of those uh, uh, pieces of sand. Now, one of the nice things that takes place is it, when you use our product in your post applying it, especially on a surface that you can't sand and polish like a non-skid surface. If you just add straight wax to gel coat, uh, you typically get a dull finish. It doesn't cure 100% and it takes time. It, it eventually becomes tack free sort of, but frequently and all too frequently, you end up seeing footprints, uh, staining, dust, dirt, all kinds of things. And the sooner you walk on it or do anything, especially in a production application, the more dirt and grime you're gonna see on it. Sometimes the nature, that nature doesn't go away. Even two years down the road, the surface can still look dirty. Uh, when you add our product to it in, in possibly a higher ratio on your final layer, you will get a much higher gloss, uh, more thoroughly cured surface that is far less likely to stain, be tacky, hold dirt, show footprints, things like that. So that's where it comes into play. And we have products designed for, for that type of use, but the clear additive gives you the option to adjust the gel coat you have into something. You don't have to bring in another product. This will, this will change the nature of the gel coat so you can use it in farm uh, more applications. Yeah, which is, you know, like we're, we're proud of all of our Duratech products, but if you've got something on hand, particularly if it's in a color scheme that you're wanting to stick with, we want to make that work as best as it can for you. So that's where that high gloss additive comes right in. So we're going to jump over to whether we're talking about Duratech high gloss additive in gel coat or a primer or a vinyl ester top coat, orange peel is a friend and a foe to us all. So Jody, what are some of our tips and tricks, particularly within the world of gel coat and high gloss additive for improving or avoiding if we can orange peel? As, as you can see on this, this picture, we have, uh, different samples of uh, from uh, high orange peel down to smooth surface. Now, I wish we had enough of the black samples that really highlight <laughs> all of the defects in the surface, but 
I made about 200 samples of these and they went so fast to distributors and people and companies and everything else because everybody wanted to see not only is it a high gloss uh, orange peel finish, a flat orange peel finish, flat as in the gloss, or if it was extremely smooth high gloss finish or non-gloss finish. We've got the options all the way around on this. Now, if you're trying to refinish a large part and you've got to sand and polish it, yeah, that's it's not fun if there's a lot of orange peel. You've got to put twice as much material down because now you've got to sand down to the deepest point of the deepest level of the orange peel to get it all smooth. Uh, if you can reduce that orange peel to almost nothing, uh, you just saved yourself a ton of work. And when I'm making small samples, I can get it perfectly smooth where you may only have to slightly sand it with, with 800 or 1,000 grit and polish it. If you were doing a flat panel like I do sometimes in my shop or in the lab, yeah, you can do that. In the real world, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, you're not going to get it perfect, especially if you're just doing this for the first time or you're not doing it that often. Uh, but it's going to be a drastic improvement over what just gel coat is. Now, in some applications, you may not want the surface to be completely smooth, so you just don't add as much of the clear additive to it. You can vary it as much as you want. And that really comes into play in, in a lot of applications. Uh, one of the things that some of the industrial outfits will do, uh, and agricultural bins are one of these, because they're out in the field, they're picking all kinds of fruits and vegetables, and these things get stained with whatever goes into the container. So they're using a low-cost gel coat that they apply to this. They post-apply it. It's not an in-mold coating on the outside of these. But after the fact, to cure the surface and make sure there's no staining and uh, to, to make things go much faster, they just catalyze the uh, clear additive on its own and spray a very, very light coat over the surface. Now, this isn't always a solution, but it is an option in this way because you will get a very good surface that's, that's high gloss and resists staining. Uh, it will be a different look than if you add it to the gel coat, but in an industrial application where you just want an easy to clean surface, this may work just great because they can go in and steam clean these things. They've got a nice surface that just sheds all of the contamination right off of it and their customers are much happier. Now in a bilge application, that could be what you wanna do. You've coated your bilge, and you want a nice high gloss finish in there and you didn't add any of this to the existing product, you can just come back and spray right over the top of it. And now you've got a very smooth, uh, smooth as in uh, not a flat non-gloss finish, which tends to be a little rougher and uh, easier to stain. But all the oil, everything else will just wash right off of it relatively easily. So Jody, where does where does tip size choice come into play? And and Allie, you can leave this slide up because it's perfect segue into general Q and A's. But you know the different mix ratios play out in terms of what the ideal tip size. But generally speaking, part of of avoiding orange peel comes down to spray technique, the pressure, and the tip size. Do you have a general recommendation? Right. To get gel coat to spray in general, you, you, if, it, if the surface is very large at all, and we're not talking about a little spot repair, but something you, you're trying to spray a larger surface, you need at least a three millimeter tip to get much gel coat out of there and speed things along. Otherwise, whatever you catalyzed in that pot's probably going to be hard before you finish. So uh, you're going to be at a, at a three or so. Now, I... Uh, Typically gel coats and our products are, they're not sprayed like an automotive paint is. You're not atomizing it as much as you would with an automotive paint. You can, but sometimes you get a bit of a dry spray. The chemistry is different. You need our product to flow on the surface a little bit more. And because it's a higher viscosity, you don't want to lose solvents. 
So I generally go with a larger tip. I the and when we're working with customers, doing demonstrations, things like that, we have some favorite guns off of Amazon that are about $35, <laughs> depending on the day that you order them, that have 2.5 millimeter tips. Depending on the day, you may get three tips, you may get a, a set of wrenches with it, you may get regulators. Uh, so check around. You can get some a pretty good package of things for $35. You don't need to yeah. spend $300 on a spray gun that is a good one for automotive paint to, to get good results with our products. Yeah. Um, then you don't then you don't cry when that gun guns up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. When uh, that when that pot life kicks and that that gum starts happening throughout your spray gun, that thirty five dollars is a little bit easier to swallow if you can't recover. You know. Yes. Uh, there's there's companies that they just have another gun on the shelf, and as soon as that one gets hard, it doesn't even pay to clean it up. You can just throw it away. So. <laughs> Uh, what you're going to want to do, and, and the other thing, now you can lower the viscosity again. We are lowering the viscosity without adding a solvent to this. So you're not compromising the physical properties of what you're spraying. The tip size, I'm usually in the range of the 2.5. I might go to three if I could find them on, on Amazon, but rarely can you find a three millimeter tip in a gravity feed gun. Some of the siphon mm -hmm. feeds you can, but you don't want a siphon feed, you want a gravity feed gun. Uh, so 2.5 is what I typically use. You can do a pretty good size area with that, no problem. And you can just throttle it down for the smaller areas. So, and again, our product not being as sensitive to the quality of the gun or the tip size, other than you need to get the volume out of the gun, uh, you can go with the large size and just throttle it down a little bit by adjusting the gun so that it sprays right. One of the things that happens when people spray is they want to use too much atomization air and it tends to dry out the material. You want this product to land on the surface and still be liquid. You want the drops a little bit larger so they can all flow together and uh, form a smooth, continuous surface. Now, there's, there's applications where the first pass may be a finer mist coat, but to get a good, sm smooth surface, you need to let it flow on the surface. So that usually means opening the tip up a little bit, uh, adjusting it so there's a good flow. And then being careful not to apply too much so that it'll sag. Any, any gel coat will sag if you put too much on at one time. And when you add our product to it, you're going to lower the viscosity a little bit. So test it a little bit. Uh, what I love to do beforehand is put some uncatalyzed material in the gun. Mix it with the, the clear additive and the gel coat or the primer or whatever you're using it in. Spray it before you catalyze it. Just put a little bit in the gun, spray it, test it. You don't want any surprises once you after you've catalyzed it and start spraying. You want to you want to be confident in what you're going to do. Use several different gun settings from too little uh, coming out to too much. Crank yeah. the air pressure up and down. You want to know what's going to work best for your surface. Spray it on a vertical surface until it sags. You want to know at how how much you can get away with. And every time you adjust the ratio of the two, the gel coat and the clear additive, it's going to change how it levels and flows and when it sags. So yeah. it, it, you wanna be pretty accurate in how you mix it and you want what you're test spraying to be representative of what you're going to be using. So that's why I recommend blending it together. And if, if you find out it's not the way you want it, you can adjust your material before you've canalized anything or started anything and get it right. Uh, you're not gonna waste much material. Whatever's left in the gun, you can pour it right back into the container. You don't need to clean your gun before you use it. You can just set the gun aside, mix your, mix your material to the right ratio, test it again if needed. If not, just uh, catalyze it and spray it. Now, one thing about catalyzing it, do not catalyze it in the spray gun. Uh, because anybody that's worked with fiberglass or gel coat, anything resins, always sees that it's so common to have some uncured material in the bottom of your tub after you uh, mixed a batch. It stays sticky. What it means is that area was not properly catalyzed, and by default, other areas of it were over catalyzed. 
you want the catal catalyzation to be uniform throughout the entire mix. So mix it in a separate container thoroughly for at least a minute. Now we recommend using a drill motor with a mixer on it so that you, it's a more thorough mix. But if you use a stir stick or something similar, be sure to mix it thoroughly. Scrape the sides, scrape the bottom, and don't do it in the spray gun because yeah. you will not get an even mix in there. You're gonna get areas that, that may be under catalyzed or over catalyzed and you're gonna get a different uh, result on the surface. So yeah. that's, that's what you wanna do. Uh, Jody, I'm just gonna jump back to something that you said before it actually popped up. Nate popped the question into the Q&A regarding um, a link to a favorite, a favorite spray gun. So Nate, I'll tell you this, that we we in our lab we have a couple of of expensive um highfalutin spray guns that we do enjoy using but by and large um what <laughs> what jody and i find is on amazon or at harbor freight tools um and i and i'm saying harbor freight tools not because i love them they happen to be about five minutes from my house so you may have another um you know, we're not co-branded. You may have another uh, another place that you can pop over and get a gun. They tend to be decent. Um, again, we're looking for HVLP. We're looking for that 2.5 or 3.0 spray tip nozzle. On Amazon, like Jody alluded to before, it kind of changes every week um, based off of what's available. It, it, these are not high end um, or brand name spray gun that are that are on there. There don't get me wrong. There are some you can get your 3M AccuSpray from there, which is a great gun. Um, but the ones that Jody is referencing that we tend to carry around, we carry them around in our the trunks of our car, and we often leave them because for thirty five dollars we feel like you can use it and make good use out of it. The, the brand names kind of fluctuate every week. And I don't know, Jody, that you and I would really know what those brands are. <laughs> and sometimes the guns are purple, sometimes they're green, yes. sometimes they're blue, sometimes they're just yeah. a silver color. You, you don't know, but in for all intents and purposes, they're all almost the same and they perform about the same. Again, like I said, some of them you might get a wrench it, it, you know for the 32 dollar gun that day you may get a, a <laughs> regulator and a wrench and three other tips yeah. and yeah. the next time and that's you look at time he and jody and i are looking for is those three other tips we want we want tips that will work with gel coat high gloss additive and tips that will work with duratech high gloss top coat so we're the, the three tips is a sweet spot for us yes so you're, you're getting, you know, just a better deal when you can get more thrown in there. And if you mess up the gun, you do have another tip, nozzle and needle, everything to use right there. So it may not be the exact same size or ideal, but it's right there on hand. So, you know, you, you've got that option. And the regulators aren't fantastic, but I haven't had any fail on me. They, they're accurate enough. They work. So I don't complain. Uh, I've got some that are years old and some that are new, and I can't say that I've had a failure on any of them, but they're not something you want to put a $40,000 paint job on a custom automotive uh, uh, refinish situation. It's, it's, they're not that gun. They're, they're ones for spraying primers and top coats and gel coats. Perfect. So we've got a couple more questions that we'll, we'll answer before we close out our session today. If we didn't get to your question, or if you think of something, if you're like me and you think of something 15, 20, 30 minutes, two days after today's webinar, you're going to see Jody, Rob, and my contact information, please reach out. The best part of our jobs is you. So reach out and talk to us and ask us questions. So some of the ones that I'm in, does Hyatt work with all coats or just in this attendee mentioned Duracoat? Duracoat is one brand of gel coat. It happens to be manufactured by Dura Technologies who manufactures the high gloss additive. The Duratech high gloss additive is compatible with most gel coats. And we say most because between Jody, Rob and I and all of our Hawkeye predecessors, we have not tested, trialed, 
seen, had our hands on all of the gel coats that are out there. So it's designed to work with gel coat chemistry and with the gel coat initiator package or promoter package. We always recommend that you test it out. And part of why we recommend that testing is because it gives you the best idea of gel time and cure time. So gel time for different gel coats is different. Cure time for different gel coats is different. How that plays with the Duratec additive changes a little bit. So testing, like Jody mentioned before, gives you a really good idea of what it looks like and what its performance is like. So thank you for that question. And, and to add Jody, to that a little bit, oh, yeah. color, color will affect how it cures and how compatible it is. If you are uh, color matching something and you add a lot of pigment to a gel coat, it will inhibit the cure of the gel coat. So it's going to, it can be problematic. And since most gel coats, well, 99.99999% of all gel coat is formulated and is used in mold, eh, gel coat just happens to work most of the time when you post apply it. There's no real R&D work done to ensure that gel coat can be used as a refinishing product. Yes, there, there are companies like us that use specific formulation so that gel coats can be used or gel coat type products can be used in post applied applications more like a paint. And our products are designed for that uh, use, but gel coats in general are not. And companies that people, people frequently buy gel coat from do not make the gel coat. These retail outlets that you can buy gel coat from, they buy gel coat from somebody else and then repackage it. We don't know what they're buying. Sometimes they don't know what they're buying. That's not an insult. They're buying a general purpose marine product frequently, but they don't know all the all properties of that. Uh, some gel coats don't cure as well. They're far more inhibited, air inhibited than other gel coats. And low emission gel coats, which is what most manufacturers are required to use, don't cure well on the backside. They stay very tacky and some of them have special repair procedures to get them to cure on the backside. So that like, like Shelly said, catalyze a small area or a small batch and spray that to make sure that it, you're getting the cured surface that you want. Uh, lower amounts of clear additive will not cure as quickly or as well as higher amounts of the cured uh, clear additive. So, so that's why we're saying 50-50 because most gel coats, the vast majority will cure 100% with at a 50-50 blend. Some will cure very well at less than that. But we can't tell you which one it's gonna, you're going to use, and you probably won't be able to find out unless you're buying from a large supplier that it comes in the original container with the information on it. So that's that's why we say in general it is. But we've run into places where people have taken a white gel coat, added a whole bunch of pigment to it to make it a new color, <laughs> and now it doesn't cure as well. And then they're asking us why doesn't it cure? And well, you kind of messed with the chemistry. Uh, pigments have, have a base resin in them. The carrier does not cure. That's why the pigments have such a long shelf life. So when you add that to a gel coat, any of these pigments, you're adding material that does not cure. So you're inhibiting the cure of it. You're reducing the cure. And then if it ages, if your gel coat is old, it's going to be less likely to thoroughly cure. Then you add pigment to it. Now you're, you could run into problems. People will say, no, this is, I, I did it this way and I had no problems. You maybe didn't have any problems. It, it may have worked or you just haven't had problems yet. As in Boston Whaler that I mentioned earlier, all that crazing didn't show up until years and years down the road when the, the physical properties of the gel coat, you know, it, it reached at the end of its service life at the lower physical property level. If it had higher physical properties, it would have lasted much longer or never cracked and crazed like that. So that's, and I'm just using Boston Weather and it's as an example. There's a lot of them out there that that uh, uh, that, that happens to uh, over brands and, and older products. So just just uh, 
morning. We do love Boston Whaler. <laughs> yes, we do. It's just, yeah. that's, a, that's a question we get asked so frequently because yeah. so many people refinish them and they wanted to know what to do with the crazings. And there was a lot of them made from the six, early 60s on. So the market is flooded with the, I shouldn't say flooded because they can be hard to get, but there is a lot of them out there and everybody wants to uh, renovate there and, and refurbish it, will make it look like new again. So that's one of the things they commonly battle. But if there was other brands out there that, that were as popular and survived as long as the Boston Whalers did, then they would have the exact same problem and they do. All right, so Allison, I'm going to have you pop over to the next screen. We, we've we kept you for your hour, so if you get to hang out with us for a couple more minutes, please do. We're gonna answer one more question that came in from Justin. But while we answer it up on your screen are some examples of our resources. Our website was recently redesigned. It is gorgeous, as gorgeous as a technical website can be, and offers a lot of resources to you, including the technical data sheets, which you see on your left, and application guides like the one that you see on your website. So as you take a peek at uh, Jody, you're gonna answer the last question from Justin, which is how does the high gloss additive affect whether that's speed up or slow down the gel time of in mold gel coat? It's going to be relatively neutral. Uh, it's not going to have a huge effect. Now, depending on the amount you add, the impression of how it's curing may be different because our products are not air inhibited. So the backside of it uh, may appear to cure sooner because it won't be quite as tacky as long. So that's one of the things that, that you may see. But as far as, as actually changing the gel time, again, gel times can vary on the gel coat from 10 to, to 20 minutes or more. Uh, it, but it, it, it's not like this is going to speed it up. Now, one of the things that comes into play here, and it's a little twist on something that we tell people is, or a, a little more information is, you can, in a post-applied application, add wax along with the clear additive, because that will allow, if you're only going 25%, and 25% is the level you want to be at with our product to get the, the finish you want or how, how you want the look, but you're gonna sand and polish this. If you add wax to it, it will cure a bit more thoroughly on the surface. You don't need to add uh, you know, the same amount of wax to it that you would without our product being added. You can typically cut that amount in half. So it's usually recommended 2%. You could use 2%, you could use 1%. It just helps that cure along and it cures the surface a little sooner. So that's one thing. Uh, and if you want a flat finish, if you don't want any gloss, but you want it to be level, and, and smooth, you can add the wax to it and it will eliminate all the gloss and now you've got a non-gloss finish. Mm -hmm. And it's thoroughly cured, unlike yeah. the gel coat with just wax in it, that won't thoroughly cure. It, it will get hard, but thoroughly cured on the surface is different than just getting hard. And that flat finishes, you know, it, it seems contradictory when we're talking about high gloss additive, but it's a, it's a popular topic in our world. Um, and the high gloss additive, like Jody said, really kind of allows you to get the best out of both. You get the durability, the full complete cure and that waxed uh, non-glossy surface. All right, well, Jody, thank you for answering Justin's question. Um, we are so grateful that you joined us, that you dedicated part of your day to spending it with us. If you haven't noticed, we are incredibly passionate about what we do and specifically about being able to talk to and connect with you. So you can see all of our beautiful smiling faces there for you. Jody, Rob and I are absolutely here as resources for you now, later in two years when you think of something that you need to ask us. In addition to our website, you can contact us directly. You can reach out to our customer team, our customer service team. Just let us know how we can help. And again, thank you so much for your time. Jody. thank you for always being such a fantastic co-host. And keep, keep watching us on social media. We have more of these webinars throughout the year. So follow us on social media, give us a call, and thanks again for your time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>